All right, happy dreary Monday. It is cloudy. It's supposed to rain today, but I hope you are having a good time, and I hope you had a good weekend. Uh, we're gonna talk about ancient India today, and it should be fairly short, but I'll get right to it here for you. Uh, the Indian subcontinent is really, really diverse, and I've got a picture of the Indian subcontinent here, so you can kind of put it in your mind. It's not just this the country of India. It's also Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, and a little bit of Afghanistan as well. And it contains the Himalayas, which are the tallest mountains in the world. It's where K2 and Mount Everest are. There's also the Indus River and the Ganges River valleys, which were two of the cradles of civilization. And then it has the Deccan Plateau towards the south and the Deccan Plateau, uh, long dry spells, and then heavy rains called Massoons. It kind of alternates between the two. Now the Himalayas, they do provide some isolation, but it doesn't keep everybody out. Traders can still get in there, pilgrims can still get in there, and some armies can still get in there too. The oldest civilization of India called the Harappans, and they lived along the Indus River Valley. I'll go back one screen. If you see my mouse moving here, the Indus River is over here on the west side. That's where the Harappans lived. Now, they're a very old civilization. Estimates are somewhere between 3300 and 1900 BC is when they existed, but they were very recently rediscovered. Uh, it was the late 1800s when their remnants or their ruins were found. Their writing and their language are both mostly undeciphered. We're not sure what they say. Um, it's been uh, it's been translated in small amounts, but not everything. Uh, let's see. We think that they are city-based. We have found evidence of two cities, one that's called Harappa, the other one called Mohenjo-Daro. And our guesses are 35,000 citizens or more. And all the cities are pretty similar. Uh, windowless houses. There was a central citadel. Some religious buildings. We find evidence of public bathhouses. Granaries to store the food. And then sewers. Yes, these people actually had a form of sewer system. We also find that the art the forms of measurements, the type of money, and the weights used were all uniform. And that tells us that there was probably some sort of central government to keep all this stuff the same. There's also um, a lack of change. And that lack of change kind of shows us that there's a, probably not a lot of outside influence. Now, if that's because their culture was just, just that strong, or if they had a strong political system, we don't know. Uh, there's so little known about their society. We guess they were probably a theocracy, meaning that they were run by a priesthood. Uh, we guess that their economy was probably based on agriculture. And there's some evidence that their religion may be related to Hinduism. There have been stone statues and bronze statues of bulls discovered. Uh, we think they had a pantheon of deities, and we think that their deities were related to, nat to nature, and we think that the bull was divine or a religious figure. Ultimately, nobody knows what happened. Uh, there are a couple theories, deforestation, uh, a change in the course of the river, or maybe an invading army. It's just we actually don't know what happened to these people. We're still researching and learning more. The Aryans are a group we know something about. Uh, the Aryans, first of all, they're not the same Aryans from World War II, completely different Aryans. So don't get Nazi Aryans confused with these Aryans. Uh, these Aryans, they originated from somewhere southern Russia, northern Iran, around the Caspian Sea or the Black Sea. And they migrated into India around 1500 BC. And 
they're not an ethnic group. They're more of a cultural group. They have a shared culture, a shared language. And a lot of their history is told through the Vedas. The Vedas, they tell us a lot about their religion. They tell us about their rituals. They tell us about their belief system. They tell us about their priests. The Vedas really tell us about them. And the Vedas were written between 1400 BC and 900 BC, so they're very, very old. And one of the things that the Vedas tells us is their class-based society. Uh, you may have heard of the caste system before. That's what this is. You have the Brahmins at the top, who are the priests. You got a group called the Kshatriya, who were the warriors. The Vaisya, who were the merchants. Sudra, who are kind of the unskilled workers. And then the Pariahs are known as the untouchables. And this is a very rigid class-based society. Now, each class has its own moral code. This moral code is known as a Dharma. And the Dharma determines what's right, what's wrong. And the Dharma controls everything. The occupations you can do, who you can and cannot marry, what foods you can eat, what social class you're in. The Dharma controls it all. And the moral code changes depending on which of the classes you're in. There was no ethnic mixing, there was no class mixing, there was no intermarrying. Pariahs are completely separate from it all. Pariahs were outcasts or untouchables. They made up about 7% of the population. They did all the dirty work like undertaking, burying people, and making leather. And whenever they were coming along, they had to bang two sticks together and they could not eat or be seen with any other group. The top three castes, they were open to only Aryans. Anybody could be a Sudra. All right, the Vedas. Two of them that you need to know. One is called the Rig Veda. It's a book of over a thousand hymns, a thousand songs. And the longer the hymn, the more important the deity. So Brahma may have a couple pages where Bob, the deity of Shutai, might have a sentence. And then you have the Upanishad, which is 200 chapters long. And it gives us what the key beliefs or the focal beliefs are of Hinduism. There's also something called the Mahabharata. It's an epic poem. It's 200,000 lines long and people used to have to memorize it. The most famous portion of the Mahabharata is something you have to read. It's called the Bhagavad Gita and that's the Prince Arjuna story that you're going to read so I don't want to give too much of it away. But Prince Arjuna and the Charioteer, that is the main part of the Gita. The Gita, it basically, you know, without giving away the story, asks people to put the good of their country or the good of their morality above anything else. Basically, sometimes heroes have to do difficult things. All right. There is this belief in the Supreme Being, and what's going to become Hinduism is very unique in that it can be both monotheistic and polytheistic at the same time. It depends on how you look at it. Some Hindus believe that there is a single deity that broke up into different parts, or that there's multiple deities that form together like a Voltron or like a uh, Power Rangers Megazord or something. Now you might say, wait a minute, single deity breaking up into multiple parts? That's actually not that foreign when you think about it. If you're somebody who identifies as a Christian, there's the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It's that same idea. Uh, Purusha is supposed to be the supreme being, and then the gods Vishnu, Shiva, Brahma, and Krishna are supposed to be all parts of Purusha. Now, once again, it just depends on how you look at it, whether... Purusha breaks apart and becomes those four other gods, or if those four gods join together to become Purusha. In Hinduism, time is not linear. It is cyclical. Truth is eternal. Truth is the most important thing. Uh, there is a soul. The soul is called the Atman. There's also karma. Now, karma is a little different today. You get what you give, or you 
you get what's coming to you that's not how karma was originally seen karma used to be this idea of actions and inactions taken every action you take or every inaction you take has a consequence it's more like cause and effect than anything else samsara is the cycle of reincarnation uh, at the end of your life your karma and your dharma are weighed and if you've done more good than bad uh, you can be reborn in a higher caste if your karma and your dharma do not balance out then you could be born into the same caste or a lower caste the idea is to reach moksha which is the release of the soul from the cycle of reincarnation and joining with brahma up in the heavens If you are somebody who is untouchable, that means basically you've done something really, really wrong and you are born into the pariah class. And from what I understand, you can never exit the pariah class once you're there. All right, now this video has been pretty short. The secret words going at the end for this lecture, uh, the secret word is gonna be news, N-E-W-S. So secret word again, news, N-E-W-S. Whether you realize it or not, we are living through history. The news you are seeing on the TV this week, last week, and even this year will eventually end up in history books in probably a dozen or two years. So just when you're watching TV, when you're watching the news, just keep in mind you're living history. So the secret word again is news, N-E-W-S. All right, that's it from me. I'll be back with you on Wednesday. Hope you have a good week.